Well, hello again. Good evening. Welcome to another Friday evening edition of Ask Your Pastor here on Whispering Hope. We are looking at a study in the book of Galatians. This is installation number three. And what a time we are having rediscovering the life transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight we take up verses six to nine and we'll be looking at those three verses as Paul here sets forth a strong rebuke of the Galatians and an also stronger denunciation of false teaching and false teachers. So we want to ask you to again invite a friend, share the link, and uh, tell someone that Whispering Hope is on, specifically ask your pastor is on. So thank you again for joining us. Pastor Peters, you're with us again tonight, and I want to ask you just to greet the folk and to share a word of prayer with us as we get ready to study. For sure. Blessings in abundance, everybody. What a privilege it is to be with you again. It's always a privilege and an honor to open God's word and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. So I want to welcome you to this segment of Ask Your Pastor and may the blessings and the rich graces of God be upon your life. I invite you to pray with us. Our Father in heaven, we ask one more time that you open before us the beauty of your kingdom, open before us the treasures of your word. May we truly see Jesus high and lift him, and may our souls be drawn to you. Father, this is our desire, to see Jesus, to come to know him as personal Savior and as friend. So bless us to this end, and may the name of Jesus be magnified. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, Pastor P, as we like to do, we like to take a little recap. So we're going to ask you again, just to briefly recap what we would have looked at last week as we studied verses 3, 4, and 5. And In verses 3, 3, 4, and 5, remember, Paul is writing in defense of the gospel. The gospel is being contaminated. The Galatians once accepted Jesus Christ and were walking with Jesus, and now they are being told that they are not really saved because they have not been circumcised according to the Jewish traditions. Those informations, uh, information is coming from the Judaizers, Jewish folk who accepted Christianity, and they are presenting that to them. And Paul, in defense of the gospel, is saying to them, the gospel that you received from God brought you peace and grace from God. The grace of Jesus Christ that saves us from sin. And now that we have been saved from sin, we are at peace with God. And if we deviate from the gospel, those two beautiful factors, basically, we are giving them up. We are giving up grace. We are giving up peace because grace and peace came from God through Jesus Christ. And so to reject the gospel is to reject Christ. To reject Christ is to reject grace and peace. And so Paul has to make that clear to them that their only connection to God is through Jesus Christ by faith. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Peters. Well, tonight we are advancing. We're looking at verses 6 through 9. I'll read it through and then we're going to dissect it. In verse 6, it says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. All right, that's where we are going to study tonight, verses 6 to 9. And here we are having a strong rebuke of the Galatians, so quickly uh, deserting the gospel of grace and a damning denunciation on false teachers and their false teaching. So, Pastor P, let's pick it up in verse 6 as we begin. Paul is astonished, he says. He is using language of amazement. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning 
to a different gospel. He's amazed, Pastor Peters. What, what's triggering this amazement? <laughs> it's like the question that Jesus asked his disciples when people began to leave, when they realized that Jesus was not just into multiplying bread and fish, and that Jesus was giving them the truth of the kingdom of God, and he's calling them to repent and to come into fellowship with God to be saved, they began to turn away from Jesus. And so Jesus asked his disciples, will you also go away from me? And they said to Jesus, but who are we going to go to? You are the word of life. To know you is to have eternal life. And that is what has Paul so baffled. Paul is saying there is no other source of life. There is no other redemption. There is nothing else that connects us to God other than Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, listen, he's shouting this out at them. If he was writing this today, it would, have, it would be all in bold letters. He's shouting at the top of his voice. Why, what are you doing? He's saying. Now, notice what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying, I marvel that you have left the church. I marvel that you have left the denomination. Paul is saying, I marvel that you have moved away from him who have called you. And this is at the heart of the gospel, and, and Elder, we need to get this, particularly our younger generation. What God has called us into is a fellowship with Jesus Christ, not just to be a member of a church, not just to be a member of a congregation, not even to just be a member of the denomination called Seventh-day Adventism or any other Christian denomination. It is good to be a member of a denomination. It is good to have fellowship at a local church. But Paul wants us to know that Christianity is being in relationship with him. And when we walk out on Christianity, we are walking out, not on the church, not on the congregation, not on the denomination. We are walking away from him who has called us to himself. And this is key to Paul. And so what Paul wants the Galatians to know is that a deviation from the gospel is a deviation from him. You are walking away from Jesus Christ, the only source of salvation. Wow, powerful. Let's unpack that even further, Pastor P. I am so glad that you went there. You are deserting him, Christ. So Christianity is about a relationship with Christ. But we enter into this relationship with Christ through the true gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. <laughs> and elders, this is key. This is key. We cannot enter into relationship with Jesus Christ through a false gospel or through any other description other than what Paul has preached. And Paul, Paul repeats this. A deviation from the gospel results in a curse, in a damnation, in a condemnation of the preacher or the congregation or the church or the denomination who preaches anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we need, we need to wake up and re-examine what we are preaching and calling the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, and Paul, Paul wants to hammer this home. That you are not, you, you're not just in a denomination, you're not just in a church, you're not just in a congregation. Paul wants, God wants you to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship, the avenue, the boat, the train, the, the telephone line that connects you to Jesus is the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. That God in Christ has redeemed mankind through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we access that by faith alone, in Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. And anything other than that cannot put us into relationship with God. And Pastor, I got to press this because today we hear, we mourn, we lament the fact that a lot of young people and even older people are leaving the church in droves. And we say we got to do something to retain them and to contain them. But Pastor, can we use in what we are studying here, in, in the context of what we, we are studying here, can we use the church and Christ interchangeably? Uh, are we saying, when we are saying that people are walking away from the church, are we saying that they're walking away from Christ or are we saying that they're walking away from membership? Ella, 
is not a difficult question. It's one that requires a response, which is the truth. Mm -hmm. There is no way around this. There's no easy answer to this. I'm a pastor. I've also served as the youth director with the attention that is to be given to young people. And what, what I have learned over the years as I combine the two experiences of pastor and youth director is that what the young people need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I have not just read about this. I have seen it in my own pastoral experience. Young people who are excited about Jesus. And so many times when we analyze the situation, we conclude that the youth in particular are leaving the church. When we interview and talk with these young people, what they want is a pure experience with Jesus Christ. What they are being given is the fluff of religion. What they are being given is a well-dressed sermon, a well-dressed denomination that is void of Jesus Christ. And what our young people need is a presentation of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ that seeks to connect them with Christ. There are many of our young people, and I'm, I'm saying young people here, not because it's, it only happens to young people, but the younger generation is, is the more visible and wider and why the percentage many of our young people who leave the church elder they, they, are, they have not ended their relationship with jesus you know they are simply fed up of religion they are fed up of the emptiness that they receive from church and this generation with all the different descriptions we have from for them from generation z and generation x and generation whatever the reality remains the same it doesn't matter which generation they find themselves in whether it's the baby boomers or it doesn't matter which generation we are ministering to, the gospel of Jesus Christ remains the same. That's the only answer to the problem. Listen, Elder, I've sat on councils of, of youth directors where we, where we examine the problems within the church, and our answer seems to be, let's come up with some more programs. Since the programs don't help, what the only answer to the problem is the presentation well, the only answer to the problem is the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember some years ago, I was asked to come do a youth week of prayer. And when I shared with them the subject matter that I was going to cover, they were concerned. I was going to, I told them I'm coming to talk about the sanctuary, Jesus, the revelation of Jesus in the sanctuary. And the youth leaders were telling me, listen, the young people are not going to be interested in that. They're not going to come. That's not what the young people want to hear. We want to revive our young people. That, that's not the subject matter. I told them, listen, I insisted. This is what I was going to present. Elder, I've never seen this in my life before as a preacher. Young people come from high school. Young people come from university. Young people come from college. By the Tuesday and the Wednesday night, young people were standing in the aisle because the benches were filled. And I was at the biggest church on the island. And the benches were filled. If you came late, you couldn't find a seat. Young people were all in the aisles, on the side and in the, in, uh, in the, in the center aisle with their, with their video cameras and their cell phones just snapping everything. Every, every, every word is recorded. The young people were excited about Jesus. And I'm saying to us as pastors, I'm saying this to us as elders and youth leaders, what our young people need is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Pastor. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Now, uh, that little phrase that he adds there, that little prepositional phrase, in the grace of Christ, Pastor P., what is he hammering home here again? In the grace as opposed to something else? Yeah. He wants them to know that a deviation from what he has preached is a deviation or walking away from grace. Mm. Now, last week we talked about grace and why he began that way. I think that was in verse number three. That's right. He mentioned grace and peace. And so he goes back to grace again, because remember, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is how, this is how Martin Luther put it, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so a walking away or a deviation from that is a deviation from grace, which is the foundation of the salvation experience, God's unmerited favor towards the sinner. And so any deviation or any walking away from this is walking away from God's unmerited favor to you. What other source of salvation is there other than the grace that comes from God through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And that is, the, that is the entire heart of the matter as far as Paul is concerned. A deviation from a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a walking away from grace. 
and salvation only comes by grace. And so what Paul is saying, you are actually walking away from your salvation when you do that. Wow, so so powerful. The opposite, it seems to me, of unmerited favor, Pastor P, is merited favor. So if you're turning away from unmerited favor, which justifies you in the sight of God, seems to me that you're then moving to a religion where you merit your standing with Christ and that we know is it, it's it's impossible but the question is Pastor P even today sometimes even among well-meaning people among us there is this bent toward works toward that I still have to do something to maintain how do we you know really get home to folk that this is from start to finish by grace through faith amen and the way that you've described it is so beautiful i i never really thought about it that way merited merited favor even if we talk about it never using that description of it which is beautiful and this is what circumcision was supposed to be i'm doing this so god could see how how good i am look at me god i'm circumcised and so when the jewish people describe the ordination they called them uncircumcised that's how they desc they describe the philistines uncircumcised philistines how dare you come up against my god and you're not even circumcised and so the jews are saying let's show god how serious we are about <laughs> our relationship with him let's prove to god how good we are when we are when we circumcise ourselves yeah. and so god paul is saying what you are doing is seeking to save yourself from sin but if you could have done that god would not have to send his son because he would have left salvation up to you and so god would be owing you salvation but god can't owe any of us salvation and what was true back then sadly is becoming the reality of many christians and sadly many Seventh-day Adventists who think that we can present ourselves to God as being good enough for salvation. And I hate, I hate to say this, but many times the way that we present, yeah, many times the way that we present religion and Christianity, we are saying to people, we have to prove to God that we deserve salvation. And so we boast of how long I've been in the church. We boast of how much we have given to the church. I built this church. I claim this seat. I've been a well-known outstanding member. And we say these things with pride as though they, they can give us some merit. They can give us some points. They can add some vat to our salvation experience. And Paul, when he examines this thing, says to us, all that we have accomplished is worse than dung. Is the filth of the earth compared to the perfect righteousness of jesus christ which we are all in need of and so this is an appeal to to preachers christ must be central christ must be presented and by extension elder this is the last message that god is sending to his last day church the laodicean message it's a message that calls the church back to righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the thing, the thing is so bad that when Jesus paints the picture of the last day church, he is actually on the outside knocking, begging to come in because he has been pushed out. His righteousness has been pushed out. His faith has been pushed out. His spirit, I solve, has been pushed out. And Jesus is begging to come back in amazing indeed pastor amazing indeed and you know, we're just looking at this verse again and i am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called in the grace of christ and are turning to a different gospel not that there is another one but there are some who trouble you and want to dispel of christ uh pastor it's almost as if paul is saying mockingly here that the this anything else that tries to come in the way of the gospel it's rubbish it's rubbish and so the question for us pastor is why is it sometimes that we are so uh prone to want to give up the real thing we have the real <laughs> gospel but then we are fooled by the counterfeit is it because of the man who preaches it? Is it because of the school who preaches it? What's going on here? Help me, Pastor. Yeah. 
Well, there are a number of reasons. And reason number one is that we are not knowledgeable of the gospel. And it is a sad statement, Elder. But many Christians do not know the gospel. Many preachers do not know the gospel. And so we present things and call them or call it the gospel. But the truth is, it's, it's not the gospel that we are preaching. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, secondly, it feeds into our self. It feeds into self. We want to know that we have made a contribution. We want to know <laughs> that God knows how serious I am. So, so let, me, let me prove to God that I love him. And over and over, the Bible teaches us the hopelessness of the human heart. Mm -hmm. God had just revealed himself to the children of Israel when he spoke to them on Mount Sinai. And the people said to Moses, man, listen, say to God, everything that he, he says to us, we're going to do. Everything that he says to us, we are going to do. And Moses goes back to God with pride. He is so happy as the pastor of the church that the church has promised to serve God. And God says to Moses, man, the people spoke well, but they are not able. God knows what's in our heart. And you will search the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will never find a place where God asks us to promise him anything. God has made a covenant with us. God has made a covenant with himself over us. Let me, let me put it that way. And that's what the book of Hebrews say, that when God was looking for someone to vow by, he couldn't find anybody. So he vowed by himself. God made a covenant with himself that he would send Jesus Christ to save us from sin. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where God asked man to agree with him to send Jesus. We never asked God to send Jesus. God sent Jesus, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the plan of salvation right there. God did not ask us to contribute anything to that, and he is still not asking us to contribute anything to it. All he's asking us to do is to accept it by faith. And he who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. But the thing really sung too, too easy to be true. And so we have added other things to it and added other things to it. And the beauty of this is, Elder, we, we will eventually get it. We will eventually get it. And as preachers and pastors, we cannot give up when it comes to the preaching of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is how I know this. The Bible tells us when we get to heaven, we're going to take the crowns, from off our head and place them at the feet of Jesus in a sign of respect. You are the only one who deserves to be here. John says they searched through heaven for someone who was worthy to open the, the, seven, the seven seals. And no one was found worthy other than the lamb that was slain. And out of respect on that seed that looked like glass, we're going to place our crowns at the feet of Jesus in humility and respect. You're the only one worthy to be there. We are not worthy. We are poor, wretched sinners. Were it not for your grace. So it's your grace who brought us there. And the Christian church will buy from Jesus the white raiment. The Christian church will buy from Jesus faith tried in fire. The Christian church will embrace the Holy Spirit of God as God brings through that reformation in the last days. So we can't give up when it comes to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I, I want to go back to the passage again, Pastor, to pose this question because it is so powerful what we're unearthing here. Paul says, look, I am astonished. I can't believe it. Really? You are so quickly deserting him. You are so quick quickly deserting him that seems to be action in progress pastor is it that they had totally abandoned him or that they were moving in that direction and so the corrective to that to bring them back is to again show the folly of false teaching and to point them back to the true gospel of christ mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the truth is, the, the parable of the lost ship gently goes searching for him or it and gently takes it back to the fold. And Paul, when we analyze the thing, the Galatians really thought that in order to serve God with all their heart, they had to be circumcised. And so at, they are doing this under the guise of true religion, not realizing that they are actually falling away from the, from the principles of the kingdom of God. And so Paul is saying, if you continue that path, you are going to fall away from grace. They had not fallen away yet. They were simply being in, in falsely indoctrinated, and they were on the verge of walking away from Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What a strong enunciation. And he follows that up in chapter 3, verse 1, by saying, Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> That's quite a chiding from the pastor there, Pastor P. <laughs> yes, pastor it P, did. But time when you have to be stern and yeah. frank with your parishioners. 
Yeah, there are times, and we have to remember when it is time to be stern and, and harsh, we still have to do it in love. Mm -hmm. and, and when we look at Jesus, we were not eyewitnesses or we didn't hear the tone, but we can read under the guidance of the Holy Spirit the pain in the heart of Jesus as he spoke to the Pharisees and the scribes, and, and he called them whitewashed sepulchers, he called them hypocrites, in a desire to draw them back to him. And as pastors, when we have to say those harsh words, we have to remember we ourselves are humans and frail and prone to make the same mistakes. And so we are all in the boat together. And that is beautifully demonstrated in the Old Testament. Whenever the prophets and, and Isaiah and Ezekiel uh, and Daniel are, are three of those key prophets, when they had to speak to the nation about their folly, they used the collective pronoun, we, we have sinned. Although they themselves did not do the per sin personally, they put themselves in the same boat as everybody else. And they cried for God's forgiveness on us as a nation. So never should we as pastors separate ourselves from the people. We have to use that we language. We have messed up. We have sinned against God. Absolutely. And even Paul himself says, I am at pains, you know, until Christ is formed in you. Absolutely, Pastor P. So, Pastor P, we look to now the strong denunciation of the false teaching and the false teachers. And he says in verse 7, that if anyone, verse 7, let me just read it again from the ESV. It says, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Pastor P, why is such a strong denunciation under the false teachers? Because a number of things are happening here. And although Paul could take this personal, Paul is not taking it personal. They, they are trying to disqualify. The Judaizers are actually saying that Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. Paul is trying to bring in this grace thing. And Paul is trying to say the Old Testament rituals are not to be kept. And so they are, they are really passionate about the Jewish religion and all the practices of the feast days. And they, they, are, they still want to practice those things. But Paul is saying to do that is to deny the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ. And Paul, remember Paul himself, his mission in life was to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he met, he had that Damascus experience where he met Jesus Christ. And so the same passion he had before, that passion has redoubled as he is now preaching Christ. And Paul knows the reality of the truth that he is now preaching, that if there is, listen, to say to the church, if an angel from heaven tells you different, you know how confident you have to be to make that statement? Very. <laughs> you have to be very, very sure that you yourself are not wrong. And Paul is saying, I know I'm not wrong because I met the man Jesus himself. Nobody taught this to me. Paul is saying the apostles didn't teach this to me. Peter didn't teach it to me. John didn't teach it to me. None of the eyewitnesses taught that to me. I became an eyewitness myself when I met Jesus on the road. And I'm telling you what I have experienced through Jesus. That if you deviate from this, it's a sure death sentence because that's what the curse is. Eternal damnation to hell. Wow. Powerful. Powerful. He says twice, let him be a curse. Strong denunciation. And as you said, what's at stake? Wow. You know, you're belittling the work of Christ. You're distorting the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're imperiling the souls of men and women whose eternal destiny hangs on whether or not they believe and live out the tenets of the true gospel. And that's what is at risk. This is not a doctrinal debate. We can sit and debate doctrinal stuff. Paul is saying this is not one of the doctrines of the church. You know? <laughs> this is salvation. This is eternal life. There is no debate over this. Mm. As church members, we can have different opinions on issues, on stuff. And we can still have fellowship. Even when we have different opinions on issues, religious issues, 
spiritual issue. But Paul is saying this is not one of the debatable things. Mm. This is the key thing in the gospel, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of God, which is salvation. So if you don't have salvation, there is nothing, there is nothing that we actually have in common. Wow. Pastor, I think that point is so vital that we have to hammer it home again. There are some non-negotiables to the gospel. And one of those, as we have been studying, or the key stuff, as we have been studying here, is that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that his sacrifice, his finished work, is all we need, and all we do is receive that by faith. There must be unanimity on, and even uniformity on this doctrine, Pastor. Am I am I am I reading you correctly? Very very much so. This this is the Christian Church cannot deviate from that. We cannot debate that. To debate that or not believe it is to disqualify yourself from being a believer. So as my, myself and another Christian can debate which day is the, is the New Testament Sabbath. Mm -hmm. He may say Sunday is the New Testament Sabbath. I may say it is Sabbath, Saturday, according to the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the creation and all of that. Myself and another Seventh-day Adventist can debate whether women should be in pastoral ministry. But we cannot debate the centrality of Jesus to salvation. We cannot debate whether the death of Christ on the cross saved the human race from sin. And this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying to the Galatians, when you made a decision to accept circumcision, you are actually saying that the death of Christ on the cross was not the source of our salvation. And that is not something that is left off, up, left for debate. Yeah, powerful indeed. Powerful indeed. The unchangeableness, the unchangeable nature of the gospel. Wow. Pastor, I think we need to underscore that, that the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus never changes, unchangeable. It will be the same throughout all eternity. And that's what we've got to nail down. That's where our only hope is found. That's what we've got to cling to. And that's what we as preachers and as elders and as teachers and even ambassadors of Christ must be unified on and must be knowledgeable of. Amen. 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 And this all of us have to agree on. Amen. We need, either we need to continue to highlight Jesus or we need to go back to highlighting Jesus and making Jesus central to our teachings, central to our preaching central to our discussion, central to our evangelism, Jesus Christ. Paul says, I don't want to hear anything among you other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is salvation. Now, everything else we preach, look at this, everything else that we preach, Sabbath, diet, the health message, dress reform, everything else that we preach, the state of the dead, everything else that we preach must be centered or must be anchored in the centrality of Jesus Christ. If we present any doctrine of the Bible and Jesus is not the central figure, in that doctrine, we are preaching another gospel. Mm, wow. And it's such a subtle line to cross, to think that, yes, I have been saved by Christ's finished work. Yet, I, if, if I don't pay my tithe, I know that I will be disqualified. You know, if I don't become a vegetarian, so to speak, I know I will be disqualified. And that's the subtle danger in crossing the line, because then you begin to say Christ's work is not sufficient. I must add to it. I must make it up. And so while these things are good and proper and come with Christian living, they in no way add to or invalidate your salvation. Pastor. All right. Correct. And that is the heart of the matter. The assurance that comes with being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And this, particularly as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to understand the assurance and the security of our salvation simply by being in relationship with Jesus Christ. We are accepted by God in Jesus Christ. And all that God is doing in our lives 
as we learn to walk by faith, and we're going to get into that later on as we get into chapter 5. All the things that Jesus is doing in our lives, in leading us to be obedient to his law, his commandments, to doing the things that, that Christians do, Christian behavior, growth in Christ, which we refer to as sanctification, is not, and as Christians we have to understand that, these things are not adding to salvation, these things are just a revelation of our salvation. And that's why we do not boast. That's what Paul says. I cannot boast about anything other than the cross of Christ. And when that is made clear, a number of things will happen. The Christian becomes a more joyous, a happier person, a more excited Christian. A burden is taken off our back. There are too many unhappy Christians. And the reason that they're unhappy is because they realize they cannot measure up to the perfection of the standard that religion has set before them. Not understanding that in Christ, we have been made perfect. Even while our, our reality says we are not. In Christ we are. And the Christian needs to understand this. And this is, this is what Paul is saying to the believer. You have already been made perfect in Christ. Circumcision cannot add anything to it. Amen. Amen. Pastor P, this is such a powerful study. And in summing up, I'm seeing that we're saying when believers, when our brethren seem to be coming under the sway of false teachers, it is then the duty, the responsibility of the preacher, of the, the man of God who is standing in grace, or the woman of God who is walking by grace through faith, to boldly rebuke the Christian in love and to fiercely denounce the false teaching so that souls may be saved to the glory of God. Amen. Well said. And we have before us a model there, a model of frankness, how Paul did it. Uh, I mean, he did it in love, as you said, but you have to be frank when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether you go up against uh, the whole world. As Paul here was going up against the mighty giants of his day, you got to be bold, you got to be brave, and you got to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anything less, we shipwreck our salvation. Amen. 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 Well, Pastor P, it's over to you now to do your pastoral bit. So <laughs> take it away as we look to wrap up. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs> For sure. Blessings in abundance to everybody. You've heard us this evening. And this evening, I just want to remind us that Jesus is our everything. The songwriter says, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross of Christ, I'm going to cling. Hold on to Jesus. Grab on to Jesus. Because there is salvation in nothing else. We can't be good enough for God, for God to save us. Listen to this. We can never become good enough for Jesus to save us. Jesus saved us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. I just want to say this. I want to take your minds back to the Old Testament sanctuary where a sinner who had committed a sin came to the sanctuary with a lamb, a lamb that was going to be offered on his behalf. When he got to the sanctuary, he went to the priest who is functioning in the sanctuary. That priest had two, a lamb and a sinner before him. The priest only examined the lamb. In the sanctuary, only the lamb was examined not the sinner. The sinner came to the sanctuary because he's a sinner. God already knows that we are sinners. Only the Lamb of God is examined. And so on Sunday morning at the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus ascended back to heaven. That's what he said to Mary when he met her in the garden. Do not hold me back, the Greek says. The New King James says, don't touch me. But the Greek text says, Jesus said to her, don't hold me back because I have not yet ascended to my father. Jesus ascended to his father where he presented himself as the atonement for the human race. The father accepted Jesus. And today, if you go to Jesus, the father has already examined the lamb. And when you accept Jesus, my dear friends, you, God accepts you in Christ. God sees you the way he sees Christ. There may be someone listening to our voice today. You've not yet accepted Jesus. My dear friends, you're not, you have not committed enough sins for Jesus to reject you. Come to Jesus as you are, with all your mess, with all your luggage and all your garbage and all the sins that you have committed. My dear friends, he has enough grace to cover your every sin. He has saved me. He can save you too. May you see Jesus high and lifted. And if you have surrendered to Jesus for the first time tonight, we want to know about it. We want to pray with you and for you. 
We want to give you some lessons and some material that would help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. May God truly bless you this evening as we see Jesus high and lifted. And may our souls, all our souls, be drawn to him tonight. God bless you in a, in a mighty way and see you next time. Amen. It is Finch. Well, folks, we want to thank you so much for tuning in to this very special broadcast of Ask Your Pastor as we plow through the book of Galatians. What a study it has been, how my soul has been stirred with the love of God and the sacrifice of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are being perfected. Thank you so much, Pastor Pete, for leading out tonight. And we pray that God will bless and keep you. Until we see you again next week, same time, same place. May God bless you and may you keep you. Good night.